Chapter 28 Higher Speed Rail Freight railways worldwide are fundamentally profitable business, and passenger railways worldwide are fundamentally unprofitable businesses. Henry Posner III, Chairman of the Railroad Development Corporation, Trains Magazine, September 2012. 28.1 A Magic Bullet After five years of construction and coinciding with the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, the first Japanese high-speed rail system, the Shinkansen, or New Train, or Bullet Train, opened. While the dates coincided, they were not mere coincidence. Both events were aimed to globally promote the image of a modern Japan. In 1967, a second line, the Sanyo Shinkansen, was begun. By 1970, Japan authorized a national Shinkansen network. Construction plans for five additional lines and basic plans for 12 others were approved. 1973. But despite the approvals, the cost of the five lines, 5 trillion yen or about $50 billion, combined with the oil shock and recessions, delayed the lines until 1989. High petroleum prices, which increased the relative demand for non-petroleum-based transportation such as high-speed rail, also increased the construction cost for HSR and reduced available revenue, thus delaying construction. Many of the new Japanese lines combine narrow gauge and wider gauge lines on the same structure, allowing both conventional and advanced technologies to use them. While the hybrid technology limits the speed of the bullet train on these routes, it permits later upgrades. As with the birth of the Shinkansen some 34 years earlier, the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan were a target for the opening of a rail line extension. Within Japan, high-speed rail has confronted the breakup and privatization of the rail system begun in 1987. The restructuring aims to achieve more efficient methods to ensure profitability in the passenger rail sector. The Japanese have continuously improved all aspects of their system over the years. Major improvements since the first opening in 1964 include the introduction of computerized crew training systems, double-decker cars to expand capacity, the use of regenerative brakes to conserve energy, lowering the weight and increasing the strength of cars, the use of electronics and mechanical system management, mechanization of track maintenance, the introduction of tilt trains, the incorporation of aerodynamic considerations in train design. As a result of these improvements, travel time from Tokyo to Shin Osaka has dropped by 90 minutes from 4 hours in 1964 to 2 hours 30 minutes, achieving a speed of 220 kilometers an hour, 138 miles per hour, the current bullet train is shown in figure 28.1. This chapter considers the reinvention of passenger railroads. In the United States, the passenger railroad is thought to be dying, yet significant investment elsewhere in the world seeks to fight the trend. Strategies include redesign, new rights of way, and restructuring by privatization. 28.2 Reinvention by Redesign High-speed rail is touted as a way to reinvigorate rail demand by reinventing the technology. There are two main technologies for high-speed rail, maglev and enhanced conventional. Maglev, or magnetic levitation, has been operational on a 30-kilometer, 19-mile section in Shanghai, China, since the start of 2004, reaching a peak speed of over 400 kilometers per hour, 250 miles per hour. The fastest system on a test track has been recorded in Japan at 581 kilometers per hour. There are also small systems in place in Aichi, Japan, and Daijian, South Korea, associated with fares. Maglev differs from railroads as we know them, sharing the concept of cars being trained together in a track, but using completely different technologies for propulsion. However, the other aspects of system building, from land acquisition to managing stations and scheduling services, will inevitably copy logic from railroads. China had planned to expand the Shanghai system developed by the German organization TransRapid to Hangzhou, but its costs and fears about radiation constrain those plans. It is now suspended and unlikely to be built, as a conventional high-speed line has been built in the corridor. The TransRapid organization is seeking to fill three market niches with maglev technology, airport to downtown, regional or commuter rail, and long-distance intercity rail. However, with on only one real system in operation, its future is unclear. It seems likely to be a technological success, but just because the engineers can do something does not mean society should do it. If only because of its novelty, the economic analysis of this technology is yet to be resolved. However, as time progresses, if costs can be brought down due to scale economies of various sorts, maglev holds some promise. In contrast to maglev, rail has been reinvented in places through enhanced conventional service. These lines include technological improvements in the train as well as more conducive right-of-way conditions. Dedicated, straight right-of-way but potential steeper grades since the rails don't serve heavier freight trains. The operating high-speed rail lines have to date followed this less technologically risky 
but perhaps less rewarding strategy. Serving high-volume nearby intercity markets, examples of this enhanced conventional service include the Shinkansen between Tokyo and Osaka in Japan, and the Trena Grand Vitesse, TGV, between Paris and Lyon in France, both of which have been further expanded, in the French case, to a trans-European network. The French TGV achieves an operating speed of 300 km per hour, with a maximum test speed of 515 km per hour in 1990. The Chinese HSR system has been rapidly constructed, but beset with corruption and other problems, leading to a fatal crash in 2011. Twenty-eight point three prelude to reinvention. During most of the twentieth century, U.S. and other railroads lost passenger traffic to autos, buses, and air service. Loss to the highway modes began in the nineteen thirties, especially in short distance markets. In the nineteen fifties, those losses continued, joined by losses to air service in longer distance markets. Most of the rail properties did not manage these losses gracefully. Passenger traffic had long been a source of institutional pride as well as a source of revenue. Contrary to conventional wisdom. Management worked hard to stem the tide of losses. It purchased new equipment and created improved services. The famous long-distance trains of the 1950s were the result, such as those operated by the Santa Fe. There were also efforts in shorter-distance markets, with the Rock Island's rockets provided an example. Why did we say the losses were not managed gracefully? Management, in our judgment, did not recognize the depth of forces driving the loss of markets. It invested at a time when graceful disinvestment, rationalization, should have been undertaken. Management did not examine possible residual market niches where efforts to create and preserve markets might have been successful. The Pennsylvania Railroad was an exception to the latter statement. Long a leader in the New York to Washington corridor, it saw service hard-pressed in that corridor by auto, bus, and air services. Distances were such, however, that high-speed rail might be quite viable in the market niche. The Pennsylvania Railroad explored options for advanced technology, maglev services that could have been quite successful had not the federal government co-opted high-speed train programs. Despite the decline of passenger rail service for over half a century, intercity high-speed ground transportation has seen renewed interest in the United States. America's National Passenger Rail Corporation, Amtrak, was formed in 1971 by assuming the passenger services of the commercial railroads, which were left to focus on freight. Despite a charter to be profitable, Amtrak has never seen black ink system-wide and really only has hopes in the Northeast Corridor, Boston to New York to Philadelphia to Baltimore to Washington. The organization is perpetually in danger of being shut down or radically scaled back, However, it provides service in many congressional districts, giving it political cover. In the Northeast Corridor, Amtrak deployed the Excella service in 2001, which travels at a peak of 240 kilometers per hour, 150 miles per hour. However, the actual scheduled time is 2 hours and 44 minutes from Penn Station in Manhattan to Union Station in Washington. Thus, the effective speed for this 368-kilometer trip, including stops, acceleration, deceleration, is 134 kilometers per hour, somewhat faster than an automobile more so in congested periods. Figure 28.2 gives some information about rail passenger use in the United States. A rough comparison with population suggests that at best 0.092 trips per capita per year nationally. Overall, Amtrak ridership is up 37.3% for the first decade of the 2000s, rising from 20.9 million in 2000 to 28.7 million in 2010, compared with a 9.7% population growth nationally. Ridership rose mo in most cities, However, New York City declined, some of which might be due to the spike in 2001 after aviation was shut down, and some of which may be due to switching between Amtrak and commuter rail modes. New York remains Amtrak's best market, with about one trip per capita per year, or more than 10 times the national average. Notably, many of those trips are made not by New York residents, but by visitors to New York. 28.4. Conception of Reinvention when discussing the life cycle of a technology, we noted three phases, birth, growth, and maturity. At any time, renewal or reinvention is a possibility, but there is a strong mating dance before pregnancy. In the case of U.S. high-speed rail, this mating dance has gone on for five decades. The deterioration of passenger train service in the Northeast Corridor, Washington to Boston, and air traffic congestion became relevant in Congress circa 1963, when Senator Claiborne Pell of Rhode Island introduced a bill asking that Shinkansen-type trains be run in the corridor, the bill was resisted by the administration in the absence of cost and market studies. However, after a good amount of pushing and pulling, the High-Speed Ground Transportation Act of 1965 emerged. It provided funds to begin upgrading the corridor, there were rather different problems in the Washington to New York and New York to Boston segments, and for government research and development. The status of work was reviewed annually in the reports on high-speed ground transportation. 
the competitiveness of high-speed ground transportation was reviewed by a U.S. Federal Railway Administration and Amtrak study of upgraded service and city pairs, and the first chapter of that report provides a useful summary. NASA supported a series of studies by McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed, and Stanford University in low, medium, and high-density markets. The references above provide information through the early 1970s. There followed a period of several years when interest in corridors seemed to wane. The High-Speed Ground Transportation Act programs were defunded. The act remained for a time, but no money was provided. Amtrak continued its corridor upgrading. The U.S. Department of Transportation phased out work it was doing on maglev and other high-speed technologies. NASA's studies of short-haul air transportation had not yielded technologies with great promise, and their program was reduced, although the tilt rotor aircraft has received attention recently. Agency wisdom at the federal level was influenced by the National Research Council, which in 1976 recommended that conventional speed rail systems be monitored with the prospect of deploying high-speed 250-kilometer-per-hour systems in promising markets in the midterm. If markets evolve, then consider very high-speed systems, 480 kilometers per hour, in the long term. The committee report just mentioned reviewed a number of corridors where there was interest in service, but the report was not addressed to nor known to those promoting those corridors. Although agency funding was reduced to zero, some interest continued in Congress, mainly because Congress was approached for funds to support local interest in systems. The result was a report by the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, which emphasized that there was no clear-cut case for maglev or other varieties of high-speed service, and that data should be obtained and carefully evaluated on a case-by-case basis. Even though the Office of Technology Assessment report was not optimistic, federal interest was renewed in 1989 when news of high-temperature superconductors came along, and Congress asked for analysis of maglev transportation systems. Actually, and in spite of what was asserted, such superconductors would have only a modest impact on maglev costs. The result was a USFRA report calling for further analysis. Other reports have been prepared with groups working directly with Congress. Both the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Department of Energy joined the National Maglev Initiative. As roles evolved, it appeared that Argonne National Labs wanted to be a leader of technical work with U.S. DOT evaluating and funding local efforts. The Corps of Engineers was to be left without a role. The 1991 Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act funded maglev research and development, but funding was sharply reduced in 1994 and disappeared in 1995. The reason given was it's too expensive. Yet, like a ghoul from a horror movie, it would not die, and high-speed rail reappeared in later funding bills, T-21 for instance. Building on deployments in France and Japan, as well as the Accela Line in the Northeast, preliminary planning was undertaken to bring high-speed rail transportation to the rest of the United States. After the election of President Barack Obama in 2008, $8 billion was authorized for high-speed rail construction in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, the Stimulus Bill. A few projects have seen construction authorized, most are modest improvements on existing Amtrak lines, and some money has been dedicated to the California high-speed rail. Since then, the subsequent Congress zeroed out new appropriations for high-speed rail, and three state governors canceled authorized projects in Wisconsin, Ohio, and Florida. Twenty-eight point five, hubs and spokes. The network architecture of high-speed rail lines has tended to be in a hub and spoke pattern, connecting a hub city, for example, Paris, Madrid, or Tokyo, to secondary cities in tree-like architecture with occasional crossing links typically at both lower speed, lower frequency, and lower cost of construction. As these systems were designed nationally, and the larger city is often the capital, as in Paris, Madrid, and Tokyo, which is also roughly centrally located, it is no surprise that the hub was based where it was. Germany has fewer very high-speed links, faster than 300 km an hour, and a flatter, less hub network, perhaps reflecting its strong federalism, relative decentralization into the multipolar urban structure, and late formation into a nation-state. Italy has centered its hub in Milan, the largest metropolitan area in the country. The reason for the hub-and-spoke architecture is to achieve economies of density and track usage and network effects at the hub city, which enable frequent service to multiple destinations. Multiple paths between origins and destinations would diffuse the network effects and result in less frequent service, and therefore reduce demand. The hub-and-spoke architecture, while benefiting the network as a whole when demand is insufficient to enable frequent point-to-point service, clearly benefit the hub cities the most, as they gain from all the incoming flows which create additional demand, and thus greater service. In air transportation, airlines often use hub-and-spoke networks, and if they have a large market share at a hub airport, will use that advantage to charge a premium for travel, thereby capturing some, if not all, of the benefits of being located in a hub airport city. As used here, a hub is a center of activity, from which multiple spokes, links connecting the hub with other locations, emanate. 
On a network with a tree structure, the primary hub is the point from which the maximum number of spokes emerge. There may be secondary and tertiary hubs in the network as well. The proposed U.S. system, such as it is, has no well-thought-out national architecture. There were a number of independent proposals that have been drawn on a single map. The existing Northeast Corridor, the only U.S. claim to high-speed rail, is part of the national plan, though it received the least funding from the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. The Northeast has the most developed network with semi-high-speed rail, Excella, running from Boston through New York to Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington. This could be described as a New York hub, though it has not been pitched as such. With current non-high-speed lines from New York emanated in particular to Albany and then to Rochester and Buffalo, or to Montreal, and spurs from New Haven to Burlington, from Philadelphia to Harrisburg and Pittsburgh, from Washington south to Richmond and Raleigh, and from Boston to Portland and Brunswick, Maine, all of which have been proposed for upgrade to high speed. Amtrak has separately proposed to upgrade the Northeast Corridor with a $140 billion proposal, which would include major tunnels into New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. One version of increased access into New York City, a proposed commuter rail tunnel under the Hudson River called Access to the Region's Core, or ARC, was canceled by New Jersey Governor Chris Christie in 2010. The proposed California corridor is based on a main line that runs from San Francisco through California Central Valley to Los Angeles, with extensions to Sacramento and San Diego. The long-term vision of the national program has a line from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. With all the commuter rail already in the Los Angeles region, the network could be more accurately described as the Los Angeles hub. Even the Sacramento line is more oriented to Los Angeles than San Francisco, despite the distance. This corridor was given bonding authority by California voters under 2008 Proposition 1A, which required matching funds from the federal government and private sector. It is still unclear whether construction will start. Construction has started, but has yet to be completed, as environmental reviews and lack of congressional support threaten the project. Then California Governor Jerry Brown is strongly behind the project. Subsequent Governor Gavin Newsom has terminated the project and no new construction will start. But the existing section can be completed. The most coherent of the new proposals is a Chicago hub, which, as its name suggests, hubs traffic from other Midwestern cities into Chicago. This proposal achieved agreement from all of the regional governors and, with the Chicago administration in the White House, not surprisingly received a large share of the recent federal allocations, $2.6 billion. The Milwaukee to Minneapolis segment was notably canceled by Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. A related system centered on Columbus connecting Cleveland and Cincinnati was canceled by Ohio Governor John Kasich. The proposed Florida high-speed rail system runs from Miami through West Broward, West Palm Beach to Orlando, Lakeland, terminated in Tampa with about 10 stations planned. Proposed additional extensions connecting Fort Myers, Jacksonville, and Tallahassee and Pensacola have also been drawn on maps, but these are further into the future. This could be described as an Orlando hub. Though Miami is a larger metropolitan area than Orlando, the branching structure is naturally geographically based in Orlando due to its centrality on the Florida Peninsula, as well as its central location vis-a-vis tourist traffic. Tourist traffic is important to this line, as stops at Disney and Port Canaveral have been included. It is anticipated the line will carry 2 million travelers yearly, 5,500 per day on 12 to 18 round trips, and is 324 miles in length. With 10 stations, there is an average of 32 miles between stations, which will bear nuisance costs, and 10 station areas, which will see accessibility benefits. The line is anticipated to run along the I-4 and I-95 quarters for significant stretches, so those areas already see some accessibility benefits at on-ramps and off-ramps, and nuisance costs between interchanges. The Florida corridor was killed by Governor Jeb Bush and reinstated by voters, only to be killed again by Governor Rick Scott. Some proposals for private passenger rail service in Florida have emerged, and a private passenger line between Miami and Orlando has been constructed. The Northwest region, or Seattle hub, connects Vancouver, Canada with Salem, Oregon. The South Central region, once dubbed the Texas Triangle, and now the Texas T-Bone, may be described as a Dallas hub connecting San Antonio, Austin, Houston, New Orleans, Oklahoma City, Little Rock, and Memphis, among others. Similar proposals in the 1990s were defeated due to lobbying by Texas-based Southwest Airlines. Proposals are floating for a private passenger rail line from Dallas to Houston, and construction may start soon. The southeast region is probably best described as an Atlanta hub, as Atlanta is the key interchange in the region, hubbing traffic from Savannah, Jacksonville, Birmingham, Chattanooga, Nashville, Charlotte, and Raleigh, and the largest metropolitan area. There is also a line from Raleigh through Columbia to Savannah, bypassing Atlanta, which is helpful for long-distance train travelers from the northeast going to Florida, but might not have much local demand. The Gulf Coast Corridor, or New Orleans hub, connects Houston to Mobile and Atlanta. This is an official FRA corridor, but seems on a slower track than many of the others, not receiving funding in the most recent round. 
The long-term program includes a line from Phoenix to Tucson, a Phoenix hub, and from Denver to El Paso, a Denver hub. But these are both isolated corridors indicated on the long-term vision without any likelihood for construction in the short term. Describing these as hubs stretches the meaning of the term, but those are the primary cities on their respective networks and are the only cities on their networks with significant feet or public transit. While these local spokes do not show on the National High-Speed Rail Network, they still exist and support the use of the term for these locales. Several cities tie together multiple hub networks. These include New Orleans connecting the Dallas and Atlanta networks as the hub of the Gulf Coast Corridor, Raleigh connecting the Atlanta and New York networks, Louisville connecting the Chicago and Atlanta networks, and Kansas City connecting the Dallas and Chicago networks. Those with an eye to drawing networks would easily conceive of links not yet on the books connecting Memphis, Nashville, and Knoxville in Tennessee, or Pittsburgh and Cleveland, or Columbus. The unofficial advocacy group, U.S. High-Speed Rail Association, has the most comprehensive network plans, including staging, which includes many of these and other links. These hub networks in the Federal High-Speed Intercity Passenger Rail Program include the top 47 metropolitan areas of the United States, and many smaller ones. The largest city not on the network is Salt Lake City, Utah, at 48 with just over 1 million people in the metro area. There is, however, a private proposal for a line serving the Mountain West, including Salt Lake. These are proposed as maglev, noting the difficulty of high-speed conventional rail through the Rocky Mountains. The hubs themselves are metro areas ranked 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, 15, and 27. The U.S. High-Speed Rail Association network includes even more cities. The political genius of the proposed intercity passenger proposal is that it includes lines in all but eight of the 50 states. This is a practice learned in transportation from previous national packages. The interstate highway system with miles in all 50 states, including special routes in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico, and Amtrak, nearly so, helping ensure strong support in Congress, particularly the Senate. Network architecture matters a lot, not just in accessibility, but in user travel time. Hatako and Nakagawa compare the Swiss railway network and the Japanese network and conclude the mesh-like network with precision timing architecture in Switzerland better serves its population than the hub-and-spoke mainline system in Japan. Economic Effects of High-Speed Rail Systems The spatial impacts of the new lines will be complex. They will favor the large central cities they connect, especially their urban cores, and this may threaten the position of more peripheral cities. Hall, 2009 The wider economic benefits of high-speed rail are difficult to detect as they are swamped by external factors, but are likely to be larger in more central locations than more peripheral locations. Preston and Wall, 2008 Examination of local land use around international high-speed rail stations suggests were it not for commuter traffic, the effects on land use will not necessarily be localized near the station, the way they would with a public transit station. Downtown stations, if they were to see land use benefits, should see higher local densities, higher local rents, and the construction of air rights over the station and local yards. Eurostar is a heavily used high-speed rail line connecting London and Paris, serving 9.2 million passengers per year. Gare du Nord in Paris, which serves Eurostar, has local land uses largely indistinguishable from other areas of Paris. St. Pancras in London, similarly. Ebbsfleet International Rail Station and Ashford International Rail Station are surrounded by surface parking lots. The results in Taiwan are similarly insignificant. Tokaido Shinkansen, connecting Tokyo and Osaka and serving 151 million passengers annually, is an order of magnitude more successful. The densities around stations on this line are visibly higher but still air rights are partially but not fully developed, indicating limits to how valuable the land is, even in Tokyo. Shin Osaka Station is adjacent to surface parking lots. The development effects are not local, unlike public transit stations, which is not surprising since if they are serving long-distance travel, they are also serving less frequent travel. And as a consequence, the advantages of being local to the station are weaker. Where they share space with local transit hubs, the effect would be difficult to disentangle. There is no grounded empirical work to date on the economic development impacts of high-speed rail in the United States, since such services do not exist. Little has been written from objective as opposed to vested sources. The effects elsewhere in the world are minimal or non-existent. 28.7. Nuisance Effects of Proposed High-Speed Lines High-speed rail, while providing potential benefits at the nodes, guarantees costs along the lines. Evidence from hedonic price studies shows that each additional decibel of noise reduces home value by 0.62%. Using the methodology in Levinson et al. 1997, the noise per train and the number of trains per hour determine a noise exposure forecast. Applying the noise exposure forecast to the number of houses affected by each level of noise and summing over all the houses and multiplying by the value of each house gives the economic noise damages associated with the trains. So, for instance, for a project running 20 trains per hour at 241 kilometers per hour, 
through an area with 1,000 housing units per square kilometer, each with a value of $250,000, would produce a total noise damage per kilometer of track of $1.975 million, not insignificant cost. For a line of 500 kilometers, this would be a system noise of nearly $1 billion. These relationships are nonlinear. Even one train per hour would produce a cost of nearly $269 million. Running 20 trains at an average of 350 kilometers per hour would produce a cost of $1.5 billion. The noise damages can be avoided if preventive measures are adopted. These include acquiring a much wider right-of-way so there is no housing near the tracks, or noise walls. Whether those costs are less expensive than accepting damages depends on the circumstances. 28.8. Reinvention by Restructuring An alternative route for reinvention of passenger rail is privatization. A decision taken in 1987 divided the Japanese National Railways into six regional passenger companies and a freight company. The British separated the ownership of the track from the trains. Private firms, including the well-known brand Virgin, operated trains on specific routes with scheduling and pricing freedom. Privatization has resulted in an increase in passenger trips. See the figure. Mismanagement of the rail track organization, which operated the track for the carriers, caused an increase in the number of crashes. While the idea of having a separate track from carrier works in other sectors, roads versus trucks, airports versus airlines, trains and tracks are more integrated technologically. Tracks steer trains, roads don't steer trucks. So the management tasks are more intricate if they are separated. This should not cause the concept to be dismissed immediately, but should suggest caution. Following on the experience, but not the success of rail track, the central government in the United Kingdom required that Transport for London, the organization that runs the subway, the underground system in London, reorganize the tube using public-private partnerships, wherein the infrastructure would be maintained by private companies, though the ownership would stay public. Christian Walmar, author of the excellent history Down the Tube, says, One could hardly write the script as fiction. On the very day that Gordon Brown is teetering on the edge of oblivion in the House of Lords, one of his cherished projects, the London Underground PPP, is breathing its last. The news that Transport for London is going to be taking over tube lines and running the contracts to maintain the tube leaked out on the very day that voters were going to the polls. Since Metronet has already gone to join RailTrack, various franchises and the Strategic Rail Authority in the big dustbin of failed organizations, the demise of tube lines effectively means that the PPP joins this infamous group. Recent proposals for rail in England suggest going back to the big four British railway companies that resulted from the 1921 Railways Act. Each railway, the Great Western Railway, GWR, London Midland and Scottish Railway, LMS, London and Northeastern Railway, LNER, and Southern Railway, SR, would be vertically integrated, operating trains and tracks in a territory. These were consolidated into British Railways in 1948. In any case, despite the problems with vertical separation, passenger trips post-privatization have risen notably. Because of its success with rail privatization and rising rail demand, the United Kingdom is giving serious consideration to what is being called High Speed 2, HS2, the country's second high-speed line after HS1, connecting a newly remodeled St. Pancras station in London to the Channel Tunnel, which would functionally replace the West Coast Main Line. Major issues include where to connect to London, how to direct to connect to Heathrow Airport, which cities in England are on the line as opposed to on Spurs, and where does it go in Scotland. This chapter reviewed the state of passenger rail planning and operations globally with special focus in the United States. Unlike traditional railroads, whose emergence was at least in part due to a forceful entrepreneur, for instance, George Stevenson, high-speed ground transportation has been a product of central planning in Japan, France, and the United States. Operationally, the systems are largely adapted from conventional rail systems, with similar labor organization and ownership in Japan and France, and similar architectures in many other respects. Despite a great deal of legislative effort and lobbying by the large engineering interests, it is doubtful that without considerable subsidy, high-speed rail could be constructed much less profitable in the United States. In contrast to assertions of operating profitably, which conveniently ignores the very high capital costs, HSR has in all cases required government subsidies. It is clear a free market would never develop HSR. That leaves open the question of whether government should. The conditions in Europe and Japan during the conception and birthing stages differ significantly from most parts of the United States. Land uses are denser and cities are closer together. A key distinction is that the regulated transportation sectors in Japan and Europe prevented competition from air travel to the same degree as in the United States when the HSR lines were planned and deployed. Thus, the market for high-speed rail probably appeared more promising than in a deregulated environment. Had air travel been deregulated and privatized at the time, 
the decision to proceed with high-speed rail, particularly in Europe, may have been difficult. A ride on many of Europe's high-speed intercity lines finds nearly empty cars. This is due to recent deregulation of air travel. As an illustration of this, Southwest Airlines was a major opponent of high-speed rail in Texas. Another distinction is the willingness of European governments to engage in subsidies and tolerate what Girondeau terms a catastrophic level of debt. Real constraints on the growth of the highway and air travel systems exist. Widely cited are congestion or capacity limits. Airports have limited capacity to serve aircraft in peak times, as do highways. In a priced system, this would result in higher user charges, but in an unpriced system, there are simply queues formed. High-speed rail, which has potentially very high capacity on its fixed corridors, offers the promise of relieving congestion on the other systems. In Europe and Japan, with important though declining conventional rail services, its extension and adaptation to a higher-speed technology was a more obvious choice than in America. In the United States, congestion capacity problems are less severe than in Japan and Europe. Moreover, conventional passenger rail has long been in a less important mode than the other two. Further, the high-volume short-distance markets for which rail is best suited are less common in the United States. For these reasons, high-speed rail remains in the birthing or pre-birthing stage in the United States. Other cited complaints against the air and highway modes are their externalities, pollution, noise, accidents, and so forth. While it cannot be argued that either air or highway modes have internalized their externalities, it also cannot be argued from a systems perspective high-speed rail does not create problems of its own. Vibration is one issue. Access to rail generally requires vehicle trips. These vehicle trips generate pollution of their own. For instance, the most severe pollution comes from the so-called cold start or running a car before it is warmed up. It is difficult to establish how much of the potential demand on high-speed rail is diverted from other modes and how much is induced travel. While induced travel may expand the economy, it certainly does not mitigate externalities. In short, while the conditions were favorable for the development of high-speed rail in Europe and Japan, they are clearly less so in the United States. The U.S. plans generally call for a set of barely interconnected hub-and-spoke networks. There is sometimes a danger of a planner falling in love with his map. There is no danger here. Even the same agencies have random maps. It seems as no one cares where the lines actually go, so long as they are high-speed rail. The issue of opportunity costs is seldom mentioned. The United States carries a greater share of freight by rail than Europe. Converting rights-of-way into passenger only, which is required for high-speed rail, may cost some of that freight share. Any money spent on high-speed rail cannot be spent on something else. The evidence from U.S. transit systems shows that lines have two major impacts. There are positive accessibility benefits near stations, but there are negative nuisance effects along the lines themselves. High-speed lines are unlikely to have local accessibility benefits separate from connecting local transit lines because there is little advantage for most people or businesses to locate near a line used infrequently, unlike public transit. However, they may have more widespread metropolitan-level effects. Cities on the high-speed rail network, and especially at the hub of an HSR network, may prosper at the expense of those off the network. They will retain, and perhaps worse, have much higher nuisance effects. A previous study of the full cost of high-speed rail in California showed that the noise and vibration costs along the line would be quite significant. If high-speed rail lines can create larger effective regions, that might affect the distribution of who wins and loses from such infrastructure. The magnitude of agglomeration economies is uncertain, and certainly location-specific, but presents the best case that can be made in favor of high-speed rail in the United States. That said, remember that real HSR, not the short-term improvements to get to 90 or 110 miles per hour, which may or may not be a good thing, but are certainly not high speed, is a long-term deployment, so it needs to be compared with cars and airplanes 10 or 20 or 30 years hence. Cars are getting better from both an environmental perspective and from a perspective of auto automation technologies. Self-driving vehicles, described in Chapter 30, should be able to attain relatively high speeds, but certainly not high-speed rail speeds in mixed traffic. Further, they may move less material per passenger than high-speed rail, trains are heavy, and so may net less environmental impact if electrically powered. Aviation is improving as well, both in terms of its environmental impacts and its efficiency. Socially constructed problems like aviation security or congestion can be solved for far less money than is required for any one high-speed rail line. While its technological advantage over conventional rail are obvious, as with all rail modes, there is a significant amount of inflexibility associated with the system design. The high-speed networks are limited, and the rails require specialized vehicles. High-speed rail lacks the point-to-point -point convenience of the auto and the speed of the airplane on long trips. Compared with greater flexibility afforded the untracked air travel system or the ubiquitous highway system, high-speed rail faces serious difficulties. As noted earlier, its mature systems, the benefits of new infrastructure in an already well-served area, are elusive. 
It will be interesting to observe the progression of the Japanese and European high-speed rail systems from growth to maturity, and to compare this with the earlier history of conventional rail. A notable chapter in the story is opening in Japan, where there is stagnation in the number of passengers served and deregulation is concentrating services on the more profitable routes. Whether high-speed rail is a new story, or simply the final chapter to the history of conventional passenger rail, waits to be seen.